So over to you, Professor Ganapati. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you can see my slide and uh, hear me also. You must be wondering what a neurosurgeon is doing with genetics. Well, I got interested in telemedicine about 21 years ago. And as early as 2015, really got interested in telegenetics. And we were actually planning to start a telegenomic section at the Apollo Telehealth Services. But then we were too far ahead of the time. And I think the time has now come where I'm, in the next 40 minutes, 35 minutes, I intend to convince you that today delivering telegenomics or genetic counseling virtually is absolutely essential and the only way to go about it. Now, the application of telemedicine for genetic counseling has considerable growth potential in the India of today, increasing awareness of preventive medicine, gradual acceptance of telehealth, particularly in the post-corona pandemic era in the last 18 months, and the widespread availability of reliable, good connectivity makes remote genetic counseling eminently doable. Why telegenomics in India? Genetic disorder, as all of you know, is a condition caused by a change or mutation in an individual's DNA sequence. Today, at least 7,000 genetic disorders have been identified. The prevalence could be as common as one in 1,000 or it could be as rare as one in 3 million. For a population of 1,350 million people, even so-called rare genetic disorders in absolute numbers comes to several million people in India who do require the services of a genetic counselor. At least 150 genetically based disorders have been identified, which could actually be treated and improving the quality of life. The global genetic testing market has a compound annual growth rate of a staggering 11.5%, 22.8 billion is what the pundits say is going to happen in the next couple of years. In India itself, in the last two years, genetic testing has considerably increased. And today I understand that the market is almost 400 to 500 crores. The most important thing is we do not require thousands of gene testing laboratories spread across India. What we require are collection centers and even 30, 40, 50, 100 genetic laboratories should suffice to deal with a country as big as India. The basic genetic test, the costs have come down considerably. I understand it was several lakhs even a year, two, three years ago. Today, it can be anything between 3,000 to 70,000 rupees. But I'm sure in the next couple of years, the, the costs are going to come down still further. Clinical geneticists are an endangered species. I understand that the less than 100 with a DM degree in clinical genetics or a DNB in genetics. The demand for genetic counseling in India is steadily increasing because of the increased number of dedicated oncology units, neonatal facilities, management of the unborn, Fetal medicine is slowly becoming a subspeciality and of course the increasing number of genetic testing laboratories. Most clinicians, and I certainly fall in that category, do not have enough knowledge of genetic tests. We are not very sure of when to order, what test to order, who exactly would benefit and certainly the interpretation is far beyond what an act, a normal average clinician can do. Most reported genetic disorders in the world are found in India, beta thalassemia, hemophilia, achondroplasia, and so on, dysmorphology syndromes. Every one of them have been reported in India. What exactly do we mean by genetic counseling? A telegenomics program is a program where a genetic counselor and or a clinical geneticist, an MD-DM, connects patients 
who need or have had genetic testing with an expert so that they understand the results. Individuals and or families at risk are identified. Specific tests are recommended and also facilitated after a detailed discussion. Genetic counseling, contrary to a general perception, starts before it is not just interpreting a test. It is discussing with the family, with the patient, why a genetic test needs to be done in that particular case or why it need not be done, what sort of test is to be done and so on. In other words, I would call it a pre-counseling. A genetic counselor will answer questions regarding the risk of transmission for specific conditions for that particular individual on a case by case basis by reviewing the result, not only reviewing the results of genomic analysis, but also understanding the hereditary family tree which the genetic counselor will put in place. Inheritance patterns are analyzed and the risks of occurrence, recurrence are discussed and all doubts are clarified. A genetic counselor, at my understanding, promotes the adaptation of medical, psychological and familial implications of genetic contributions of a specific clinical condition in a family member. A genetic counselor, therefore, assists the family to take decisions to affect changes, to prevent, manage problems, including identifying the probability of developing a condition and more important, the risk of passing it on to future generations. Premarital antenatal genetic counseling is often helpful. Genetic counseling translates genomic information into adaptable, clinically meaningful, compliant interpretations. Now, what is, how is genetic counseling totally different from other types of counseling? This is an ultra niche area. And honestly, I think most of us are just incapable of analyzing the reports or interpreting the report, which I'll be showing you before the end of this talk. The educational background of the beneficiary is very important. We need to understand that 95% of those who are afflicted with these conditions probably do not know exactly what is DNA, what is RNA. They are not aware of Gregor Mendel. They do not know what is dominant, what is recessive, what is expressivity, and so on and so forth. And all these highly technical things need to be conveyed in a language which the family understands, not necessarily in English. This is a challenge for the genetic counselor and the genetic counselor, therefore, must be an absolute master of the subject to be able to explain to somebody who does not know the difference between DNA and RNA. The most important thing, why am I talking about this as a telemedicine expert, as one who is passionate about remote health care? Because 99% of the genetic counselors live in the metros and maybe in the state capitals and almost none exist even in tier 2, tier 3 and definitely in the major part of rural India where blood collection is extremely easy but there is no way you can have access to a genetic counselor. Proliferation of collection centers an increased number of gene testing laboratories and reduction in cost is going to make genetic testing feasible in the next year or so or even earlier. Now, it was amazing to see how in the United States, the last two years, the literally hundreds of companies have sprung up to solve what they call America's genetic counselor shortage. In an advanced country like the U.S., it is said that you have to drive 100 to 150 miles to be able to get, speak to a genetic counselor. You can imagine in India how difficult the condition is going to be. What are the potential benefits of genetic counseling? 
this would be almost the same as that in any other remote healthcare, namely obvious things like reduced travel time, reduced waiting time. Obviously, the cost also would be less. Imagine somebody having to travel a thousand miles with a family member and just to spend 30 to 40 minutes with a geneticist. This can be done at the con at your convenience, in your house, in your work spot, etc. at a mutually defined time and so on. Video conferencing, real time, store and forward where the entire family history, the entire clinical data, everything is sent in a store and forward method. Remote monitoring can be done and so on. So this is basically how genetic counseling is done. I am absolutely convinced I belong to the BC era. When I say BC, I don't mean before Corona, but before computers. I was the last set of neurosurgeons in India who were trained before even computers came into a hospital. But I am convinced that in the next couple of years, the emphasis is not going to be on diagnosis and treatment. The emphasis is going to be on preventive medicine. We are going to spend more and more time on promoting health literacy and empowering the patient. Therefore, the general level of awareness of genetic predisposition, inherited conditions. In fact, this is even going go into the area of, of uh, what you call uh, health of uh, primary health care and uh, 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 health counseling, if you want to call it diet and fitness counseling a master health checkup, then NCDs, diabetes, obesity, hypertension. People have already started looking whether there is any genetic basis to all this. And of course, we do not have enough data for India. But in a couple of years, I'm sure in India, we will be able to identify the genetic basis of several non-communicable diseases. From a public health standpoint of view, if we will be able to identify a risk estimation, the carrier status, and more important, your ability to metabolize a drug. Pharmacogenomics is a new subspeciality in genetic counseling, which again is going to come very fast, very soon. PPP, personalized medicine, preventive medicine, risk mitigation, knowledge. People believe that the more information I have, it is better, and to take proactive decisions about our health. This is how the world is going to change completely in the next two, two three years. Genomic testing can help doctors to determine whether a malignancy is aggressive, fast growing or slow growing. Today, we know that it is not treatment alone which determines the way in which a cancer progresses. It is a biology of the cancer. Even your response to radiation, your response to chemotherapy is to some extent contributed by your individual genetic profile. Knowledge of this will considerably help not only the doctor, but also the well-informed patient. We need to monitor patients who are in a remission stage to catch a potential disease progression. Now, most of the next few slides I have taken from published literature, particularly from American companies, just to show you that this is what they do in the United States. And I think it's just a question of time before all this becomes very doable in India. It's already started. So general reference guidelines for prenatal indica indications. Obviously, every pregnant woman, we are not going to even suggest a genetic study. But then there are specific clinical indications. Many of you are familiar with it. Elderly pregnancy, for example, a woman who will be 35 years of age or older, multiple repeated uh, abortions at a previous stage, miscarriages, history of stillbirths, fetal anomalies identified via ultrasound and so on. This is available in great detail from a scientific point of view. And today we know exactly who is at high risk and who is the lady who requires and who will benefit by antenatal diagnosis. 
This need not be a chorionic villus sampling. It could just be a maternal serum. Of course, in specific indications, it could be amniocentesis as a diagnostic test and so on. I am not going into the details, excepting to tell you that considerable amount of information is available on this. And here again, you can see, depending on whether you are in the first trimester, the second trimester, etc. Uh, so many things you can have a genetic basis, vision, hearing. And I believe that even in my lifetime, I'm going to see what is called augmentative neurology. And I'm sure in the next 10 to 15 years, maybe we will be able to identify a genetic profile where you will know whether the unborn child is going to be six feet, two inches in height, whether he's going to develop a cardiac output, which is so high that he could take part in an Olympics race and so on. In other words, it is going to totally change the way life is. What are the general referral guidelines for pediatric indications? I don't expect you to go through the slide in detail. Anybody who is interested may please contact us. I'll be happy to share the entire presentation with you. The, the purpose of this talk is just to create an awareness so that we understand that hundreds of people could benefit if for the right properly chosen patient, we refer the patient at the appropriate time for a genetic testing. You can see here unusual skin findings and a failure to thrive, metabolic disorders, abnormal brain MRI findings, all this is available. And genetic test results can impact treatment. It can inform unaffected individuals of possible future risks. Of course, there's a lot of ethical issues in this. I'm not at all sure may not be possible today, but someday it may be possible to predict that you, uh, an unborn girl, could probably be carrying the BRAC1 type of gene and perhaps 30 years later develop a cancer breast. There are studies which indicate that prophylactic bilateral mastectomy can even be recommended because the genetic studies will give a 99.9% .9 surety that this young girl will develop a cancer breast subsequently. So these are a lot of ethical issues which need to be solved over the next few years. Carrier screening for cystic fibrosis. Yesterday in the newspaper, I read somebody from Telangana cost has raised to crowdfunding seven crores of rupees for one injection for the management of spinal muscular atrophy. Today, it is possible to diagnose spinal muscular atrophy through genetic tests even in India. The most important thing is many of whatever we are talking today would have become absolutely superfluous or un unnecessary in the sense no, I would never have believed that I could get a genetic test done for spinal muscular atrophy when I was a postgraduate in neurosurgery or even when I was an active neurosurgical practice. The last three years, the developments have been phenomenal in the field of molecular biology and genetics. And today we are almost on par with any genetic testing which is done anywhere in the world. Oncology is one major area where genetics has already made and will continue to make. It is absolutely surprising for a lay person like me to understand that genetics has a major role to play in colon colonic cancers, uterine cancers. I was only aware of breast cancer, but I didn't know that you it plays a major role in endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, etc., etc. And every one of these testings are available today. As I mentioned earlier, this is important because your response to chemotherapy and radiotherapy can to some extent be influenced based on your genetic profile. When does a person refer a patient to genetics? I'm not even sure, excepting a very academic uh, oncologist. I am not even sure whether an MD general medicine or whether an MS general surgery will be familiar with all this. And this is where a genetic counselor comes into play. The moment we know 
that there could be, this could be an inheritable type of cancer. There is a group of cancers called hereditary cancers. Once a doctor, a consultant knows that this could be a hereditary cancer, he just doesn't have the time, the background, the knowledge, etc. to do a detailed study of this. This patient could be referred to a genetic counselor who would advise whether further testing is required or not. Normally, this would not have been practical, just not doable, asking a person from a tier three city to travel to a metro. But today, in half an hour, we can make the genetic counselor appear in front of a screen and display PowerPoint presentations like the one I'm showing you today. And the patient can be, we can come down to the level of a so-called less than normal literate patient and using photographs, using videos, using images, the person can have a thorough education and be told whether a genetic test is re required or not. I just don't have time to go through all this and just to convince, just to tell you that today considerable amount of detail is available on hereditary cancers and all this is freely available. Just for my own knowledge, as I had mentioned in the very beginning, I am not a physician and uh, I would not know about this. So just for my own knowledge, I prepared specific clinical indications for genetic counseling. And I was astonished when I got all this. I went to the literature the last couple of weeks and I was astonished to find that I was able to get 110 conditions where specific genetic genetic testing is indicated. Now this, if I, a non-specialist, a non-expert, an outsider, literally, I'm able to get this. I'm sure genetic counselors and geneticists will be able to, will be able to identify much more. This is whether it is uh, atrial fibrillation, arrhythmias, color blindness in dermatology, uh, ichthyosis, zero derma pigmentosum and so on and so forth. Sickle cell anemia, of course, many of this, we are aware of this, but a lot of conditions where, of course, you can always argue that it doesn't matter. A club foot is not so, uh, you know, not that important, but a congenital limb defect is certainly important. And as a parent, I certainly would like to know if there is a risk and in the event of a woman getting pregnant again, what are the chances of the ch unborn child developing a congenital limb defect and so on? So as I told you, I have been able to get 110 conditions. Probably there are another 100 or 150 which is available in India. Now, I'm just showing this slide just to show you the complexity. I would have liked to think that as a neurosurgeon who has been practicing for 45 years neurosurgery, including spine, I probably would have seen at least uh, 60 to 75 cases of proved ankylosing spondylitis uh, during uh, who come to the neurosurgeon for spinal problems. I had absolutely no idea that there was a genetic component in ankylosing spondylitis. Now, honestly, I would not be able, other than reading it out, your genotype, your risk allele, A, G, T, whatever it says. I have absolutely no idea of what is 16, Q, 23, C, T, R, B, etc., etc. But imagine if you were able to get, imagine you are a clinician, a patient comes to you, you know that there is something called genetic testing and somebody uh, understands all this, explains all this and then says, look, this is the risk of your developing a breast cancer. Average population risk is one in five. Your genetic risk is 0.96, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. All these details are now available in India. It is easily available. You do not need to have a geneticist or a genetic counselor in the city where you are. These slides were just to show myself. I have no idea. Uh, ulcerative colitis. Yes, I've heard of it. I know what is ulcerative colitis. I know what is restless leg syndrome and so many conditions like this. Uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, colorectal cancer, etc. Every one of this, the information is available. And uh, we now come to drug response. I was not aware that this is actually happening in the real world. I was under the impression that this is okay for a DNB uh, dissertation or for a DM dissertation. But I was shocked when I found that today in India, 
there are people who carry genes with a response to warfarin or with a response to even drugs commonly used like tramadol is totally different. In head injuries, in fact, even response to mannitol, I understand, is to some extent based on your genetic profile. I do not for a moment suggest that we need to do a genetic profile for everybody who's on warfarin. But if clinically indicated, if the results and if the clinical outcome is not corresponding to what you would have expected, you need to think if the metabolization of the drug is different and you need to do a drug response file. So uh, clopidogram, this is something which all neurologists and most physicians use. Many of these drugs are used by all of us and interpreting this, deciding on whether a genetic profile is indicated or not. Impact of genes, ovarian cancer, Parkinsonism. Now, as a neurologist, I have seen many, many cases of Parkinsonism. Of course, I have not investigated a single patient from a genetic background. And maybe perhaps uh, a neurologist would can always seek the opinion of a genetic counselor and find out whether there is any indication in that particular case to have genetic studies done, etc. This is the methodology we use. I would like to emphasize again and again what when, when, when we raised this about five years ago, I, I had given a talk on uh, telegenomics in the Yale University in the United States. And we were not that interested then because the number of genetic laboratory tests were in single digits, not even in double digits. But today, I understand that there are collection centers or some non-invasive collection of blood and saliva from the remotest part of India. Today, our courier services are excellent. Packing is excellent, etc. And therefore, you do not need to have a genetic testing laboratory. Even in the city where the patient is, it can always be sent by courier to wherever, whichever part it can be done. So this is just the processes, how the clinician will order the test, how the sample will be collected, the physical report, downloading. Today, everything is electronic. All you need to do is to send the link. Of course, before that, commencement of lab processing, quality check, sequencing, next generation sequencing. In case the sample is not, cannot be, a study cannot be done, you want, uh, a second sample may have to be sent and so on and so forth. Sending a video link and so on. All this is extremely simple. It is very, very simple to put in place a standard operating procedure. You can have a spark, a single point of contact. You do not even require an MBBS. Any tr secretary trained in a couple of hours, that is all that is required, can manage this entire process. And uh, appointment can be fixed at the convenience of the genetic counselor and the convenience of the patient. The, when I was doing a literature search to write an article, I was absolutely amazed by more than the PubMed index journals with the, with the numbers run in thousands literally was the uh, commercial viability of these uh, uh, organizations, of course, mainly in the United States, the number of courses, the number of books available, number of journals available, it was absolutely uh, unbelievable. I mean, I could go on and on, but I would like to take some questions. So what would be my take home message? My take home message is 53 years ago, when I entered the Madras Medical College, most of the super specialties and subspecialties which are available today were non-existent. There was no such thing as DM genetics. There was no DNB genetics. No medical college had a geneticist and so on. 21 years ago, when we started telemedicine, in my wildest dreams, I could not have foreseen that specialities and super specialities would not only be necessary in telehealth, but would actually start to happen. Today, in India alone, we have a society, a separate, the Telemedicine Society of India was founded 20 years ago. Uh, last year, we had the Tele-Ophthalmology Society of India, the Tele-Radiology section, and Tele-Rehabilitation is soon become a distinct standalone entity. These are recognized disciplines in India. I am optimistic that in my lifetime, I will see telegenomics 
develop as a distinct standalone component of telehealth simply because we are unlikely to have enough qualified trained clinical geneticists or genetic counselors even for the several million who require these highly specialized services it is wrong to say that the denominator is 1300 million not at all but even assuming that it is 0.1% even a one in a thousand of the population require we are still talking of 1.3 million people who do have genetic disorders and probably the number would be nearer 5 million if you take everything into account with exponential increase in the use of information communication technology 5g is going to be a reality in one year from now and unfortunately physical distancing i do not like the word social distancing i don't think we should ever ever socially distance on the contrary we should virtually it is possible for us always to be get to be together socially we can be together through uh, inform through video conferencing but physical distancing is going to be the new normal even if we don't get a third wave even if we don't get a fourth wave life is never ever going to be the same again and hence formal organized remote healthcare or formal organized telegenetics or telegenomics is here to stay i started stereotactic radio surgery in 95 and i have more than a quarter of a century's experience of how we develop a small sub speciality today there are at least 30 radio surgery units in the country most it is most important that if you need to grow and develop a specific sub area you need to have everything put together and for even today of course you can always argue that genetic counseling was not uh, was is happening for the last several years yes of course video conferencing is happening people are making telephone calls today you even have a whatsapp video google video etc etc anybody any genetic counselor can uh, uh, a doctor can always contact a genetic counselor and this can be done very informally which is already happening but i believe that we require knowledge we require data we require information all of us know that genetics is to a large extent dependent on the race caucasian is totally different from asian we just do not have to the best of my knowledge enough data in large numbers to have our own genetic profile the human genome no doubt is universally applicable but there are certain differences and this is a great opportunity for geneticists and genetic counselors to record all data electronically with an electronic medical record with digitalization of genetic services in 5 to 10 years from now you will have a tremendous amount of uh, information available big data analysis can together be done today and i am convinced that based on the secondary research which i have done in the last couple of months just by reading articles just by going through uh, the internet etc i am absolutely convinced that telegenomics telegenetic counseling is a big big commercially viable stand alone doable pro project which will also help not only the genetic counselor not only the clinician but ultimately which is what every medical doctor stands for yes roi is important return on investment is important there has to be vitamin m without vitamin m without financial compensation nobody would be interested but having said this the pleasure the happiness the thrill of having been able to diagnose of having been able to advise of having been able to prevent a down syndrome a trisomy 21 of having been able to identify with pharmacogenomics that this is what you do that this drug should not be given that this chemotherapy is better given after radiation instead of before radiation the happiness and thrill which you get out of that 
it may take a long time. See, when we, when I started telemedicine 21 years ago, everybody laughed and ridiculed. Today, the laughter is much less. Telemedicine has become accepted as a part of our life. Similarly, I am sure in the, very soon, telegenomics will become an integral part. It will be a, fun, a major role in the healthcare delivery system. Telemedicine, telehealth, is going to be in the forefront. We are no longer being knocking around. We no longer are going to be begging people to uh, adopt telemedicine. No less a person than the Prime Minister of India in every single speech, every time he has addressed the nation, he has talked about telemedicine, telemedicine. Today, every state in the country, every one of the 539 medical colleges in the country have been asked to have a department of telemedicine and a nodal officer. And I'm sure in two years from now, out of necessity, the a strand of RNA has acted what I call the global chief transformation officer. A strand of RNA has made geography history, has made distance meaningless. I also think it is our responsibility, it is our duty to provide to bridge the ever-increasing urban-rural health divide. Never in the lifetime of my great-great-grandchildren will there be geneticists in a district hospital. There may not even be geneticists in every medical college. Geneticists will be available only in the national institutes and perhaps in a state medical college. But at least the 539 medical colleges, the 7,000 centers recognized for DNB training, at least these departments should have access to clinical genetics. And the only way this can be done is through a formal, well-organized telegenetics department. Uh, I wish to thank Medvasity and Dossoli for arranging this program. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening presentation. So uh, in case any attendees have any questions, uh, so uh, they can uh, pose their questions in the chat box. So uh, we have one question, uh, sir. So is it possible to pursue PG in telegenomics after MBBS or is it after MD, MS degree? Uh, very good question. Unfortunately, you're asking the wrong person. PhD requirements are essentially a function of the university. It is the university registrar and the board of studies who said that. Having said that, uh, we would be very happy to help you. We are recognized for so many things. It depends entirely on the individual. Uh, many universities may do permit an MBBS to directly register for a PhD. It depends on so many factors. Its answer is not so simple as yes or no. Okay. So I hope uh, your question is answered, Rajeshri. So we have one more question. Um, I'm not quite sure it is not phrased properly. So uh, mentally problem, what is the genetic problem in that? Sorry, repeat the question. I didn't hear you. Yeah, so it is in a mental problem. What is the genetic problem? So it is not phrased correctly. Yeah, so okay, fine. Uh, again, uh, I wish I was able to answer that question. I don't think even a, a head of the Department of Genetics, All India Institute will be able to answer that question. Answer is very simple. We do not know. We do not know. We do not know. And I don't think we will ever know for the next 20, 30 years. You need to understand that life is not so simple. It is not mathematics. Medicine is not black or white. It is various shades of gray. There is always a component of genetics and there is an external environment, nature and nurture. That is what we call it. And men, when you say mental, it includes at least 30, 40 different conditions. Each one is different. So this is a, the, the, this is a question which will take 10 years to answer. Okay, so I hope uh, uh, your question is answered, Mr. Deepu. So uh, we'll give a minute to uh, the attendees to post in any questions if they have. So I see Dr. Meera raising her hand. So uh, uh, Dr. Meera, in case you have any questions, you can post in the chat box.
So, sir, a lot of people have requested for the recording of the presentation and the PPT as well. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll send a PDF to you. PPT will be too big. I'll send a PDF to you later. Recording, we will uh, let's see the recording and then we can make it available. I think. Sure. So uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Harshit. Uh, what can we do to increase awareness as a medical student? You are a medical student, I presume. Okay. The well, the uh, I presume that genetics is a part of your MBBS curriculum. That is one. We have been trying very hard to make telemedicine a part of the MBBS curriculum, but it's so difficult and uh, we have not yet succeeded. I think maybe telemedicine will become a part of the MBBS curriculum in a year or two. But to create awareness, this is a beginning. This talk is the beginning. People like you can play a very major role. You need to talk to others that there is something like this. And uh, you uh, see, the, all this has to be done at an individual level. You need to talk to your dean and tell your dean, why don't you arrange for a talk? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? This has to be done at that level. Once a few people get interested, see, creating a movement always takes a long time. It's very, very difficult. So what I would suggest is at your college level, you talk to your professor, tell him you're interested in this and uh, ask him to arrange something, etc. Thank you, sir. I hope, uh, Harshit, your question is answered.